and welcome to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. Glad you're with us. We're here each and every week discussing topical issues and meeting interesting people. And this is a guy who, have we had him on the show before? Yes, this we is have. his second I was going to say, it's been a while, though, since we've yes. had John Richter on the show, and always uh, fascinating to hear all the things that are going on in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Well, yes, uh, I hope our viewers will know that John is the chief uh, law enforcement officer for uh, federal law here in the Western District of Oklahoma, which is most of the state mm -hmm. but from a county standpoint, but it's basically I-35 uh, uh, West mm -hmm. uh, is the Western District of Oklahoma with a uh, that's almost correct. But he is in charge of uh, both civil and criminal enforcement of the federal laws uh, here in Oklahoma City and in this district. And he's a very active uh, guy. He's got a lot going on. He certainly does. And we'll get to it. John Richter, today's guest on The Verdict, when we return after this. Everyday America uses clean burning natural gas instead of coal or oil is a day of victory for our environment. That's why Chesapeake chose to explore for natural gas exclusively, and we've never looked back. Because natural gas burns twice as clean as oil or coal, and reducing carbon emissions to combat potential global warming is every bit as urgent as cutting our dependence on energy imports. As America's number one driller of new gas wells, Chesapeake is moving fast to find untapped reserves of natural gas here at home. It's the right fuel for America's economy and the fuel for a clean air future. We just happen to be early to see it so clearly. Chesapeake, natural gas wins the day. Wilsey Meyer Eatman Tate. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma working with the owners of small and medium sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. Wilsey Meyer Eatman Tate in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. We're pleased to have back for a second appearance on The Verdict, uh, John Richter, the United States Attorney for the Western District of Oklahoma. John's been in this position since 2005 and runs one of the uh, uh, larger law firms, if you will, uh, in this uh, part of the state. He has 40, approximately, uh, U.S. attorneys working with him. They do both civil and criminal work. Uh, John is kind enough to give us his time in this very busy time of the year for him uh, to come uh, join us. Uh, I might just mention that his wife, Lisa, also is a lawyer and teaches uh, law at the University of Oklahoma. John, welcome back. Great to be here, Mick, <laughs> Kent. Uh, nice to be back. Thanks. Very broad question. What's going on in the U.S. Attorney's Office these days? Well, uh, we're busy. Um, you know, we are at, at record levels in terms of the number of cases that we're filing and the number of defendants uh, that we're convicting, so we're highly productive. Um, I think really three uh, major areas that are, are really exciting right now, certainly our anti-gang effort. We just, uh, we've been very, very busy on the enforcement side, uh, taking down a lot of the violent uh, gang members in Oklahoma City. On the prevention side, we just dedicated, uh, uh, with, uh, of course, the mayor's help, uh, dedicated a community service center on the east side of Oklahoma City that's going to be providing a lot of prevention and reentry services uh, to uh, citizens on that side in hopes that uh, we can stop some of the young people from ever getting involved in gang and criminal activity to begin with. Um, also, on the, on the, uh, in the child uh, sex and Internet crime uh, arena, uh, we're, we're very, very busy in that arena. Uh, working with the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force in uh, uh, across, which is a statewide task force run by the OSBI, 
and the FBI. Uh, they are now co-locating some of their assets in a space, dedicated space within my office, and we've seen a, a great deal of productivity in that arena, working closely also with the U.S. Marshals uh, in going after uh, sex offenders, convicted sex offenders who are failing to register. And then finally in the financial fraud arena, obviously with the, uh, the downturn in the economy in particular, we're seeing uh, uh, some real growth in, in our investigations and prosecutions in that arena. Well, uh, let me ask you, I saw a, a report in one of the media outlets uh, recently about Oklahoma City uh, and uh, the Mexican uh, drug cartels activities. Do, are you seeing any sign of that being significant here in Oklahoma City? Well, we've seen uh, the Mexican drug cartels have controlled the flow of drugs into the United States for quite some time, and, and that's certainly no exception here in Oklahoma City. Ultimately, uh, virtually all the um, illegal drugs, and when I speak of that, marijuana, cocaine, um, and the bulk now of methamphetamine and other uh, drugs of abuse um, are uh, ultimately have their source uh, in lar to a large degree from Mexican uh, cartels. Um, and uh, so most of our drug investigations ultimately were looking at offenders uh, here and then going after regional targets and then ultimately the priority targets, which are consolidated priority targets, which are the Mexican cartels and their and their uh, leadership. I have read much about the uh, the problems being created in the city of Phoenix, and it seems to be a, a new hotbed of illegal activity and a number of kidnappings taking place. And it seems like there's a stronger hold uh, by the Mexican cartel in that specific area. Is is that just an example, or is Phoenix one case that's that seems to stand out among all the others? Well, I think Phoenix, being closer to the border, um, has far greater problems, obviously, than Oklahoma City does, fortunately. Um, but I think it is indicative uh, on a greater scale uh, uh, of what, what we see in major cities around the country, which is that, that gangs and drug trafficking organizations ultimately, to get their source of supply, deal with the Mexican cartels. Uh, and so the drugs are flowing north and the money flows south. Uh, and um, that has obviously been on our radar screen for a long time, and we're fighting very, very hard again and, and making a lot of uh, a, a great deal of success. Well, how do you stop it from getting north of Phoenix? Or I mean, at, at what point, uh, you know, does, are, do these things continue to evolve northward? Would that be the Mexican cartel's plan to continue to have stronger holds on, on cities throughout the United States, or are they are they uh, ready to stop it at, at where it is now? Well, I think the the what we're seeing right now, which is the escalation in violence uh, south of the border is an, it, an indication of the success that the Calderon administration is having and the pressure that they are putting on those Mexican cartels south of the border. The president of Mexico. Mexico, yeah. the president of Mexico. Ultimately, to solve their cartel problem, the Mexicans have to deal with it. We can help them, we can assist them, and we, we certainly are trying to do that. Um, as far as uh, things go here, uh, I, I know that uh, the Department of Justice uh, and the administration are trying to move a lot of resources down toward the border and taking efforts to make sure uh, that we're doing everything we can at the border. As far as interior districts, we are uh, moving very, very aggressively against drug trafficking organizations and, and gangs that distribute drugs here in Oklahoma City. Um, we have taken down uh, a record number of, of uh, gang members in the past couple of years um, that are involved in, in drug trafficking here in Oklahoma City. Um, and that is, uh, while that doesn't obviously eliminate um, the problem, uh, it certainly eliminates some of the most violent uh, members who are, are in that business. Uh, and so that's, that's all part of a comprehensive effort. Um, the nice thing is, is of course, we're also seeing a, a uh, decrease in the use of these illegal drugs by young people in this country. That, that was a great, one of the great unheralded successes, I think, of the prior, uh, during the Bush administration, was we've seen record lows in the use of cocaine and marijuana and other drugs of abuse among teenagers. And of course, that's the greatest predictor uh, of, um, uh, of, of use of drugs as in adulthood. Um, and that, what that means is that demand um, is, is very, very level and, and trending down. Uh, and that obviously puts increased pressure on those cartels also. You were on uh, our show in 2005 or early 2006, uh, right after you assumed uh, your position at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I know you at that time had some ideas about how things might work and what might not work. And looking back on it now, four years after, uh, what are your 
what are the things that you could point to with most pride about what your office has been able to do? Well, we've, uh, we have in increased our productivity uh, here in Oklahoma City a, a great deal in our office. Uh, uh, we, like, as I said previously, uh, over the past three years we have filed record numbers of cases, um, put record numbers of um, defendants uh, in federal prison, and what that does is essentially uh, protect uh, the citizens of western Oklahoma um, from some pretty serious, uh, uh, serious criminals. Um, and, and obviously our number one mission is, is to protect uh, and preserve um, uh, the, the liberties of, of the people we serve, and, and that is a, a critical part of it. We also have focused in some major areas, gangs. I think we've been very, very successful in bringing together a coalition led by the Oklahoma City Metropolitan Gang Task Force uh, and the Safe Community Coalition. Um, and, uh, and, and Mayor Cornett serves as a co-chair of, of the Safe Community Coalition. And we have really focused the city on doing everything it can to, re to reduce gang violence. We've seen a significant decrease in drive-by shootings, for example, mm -hmm. down from a record high in, in 2005 of almost 250 down to about 136 in 2008. That's still too many, but that's a considerable uh, improvement. Uh, Gang-related violence is down considerably within the city. Um, I think we've also pushed very hard uh, in, in the uh, uh, sex offender area. Uh, we have a, one of the most uh, uh, developed programs in terms of ensuring that, that uh, sex offenders are held accountable, that they, they register <laughs> and they stay on the right side of the law. Uh, and that obviously goes a long way to protecting our children and protecting families. Um, and then finally, I think overall, uh, our, our office in, in the, on the white collar side has improved. We've, uh, in our financial fraud task force, we have built up its capacity uh, by about a third in terms of the assets brought to bear on that. We've added financial analytics support, and that has prepared us well for uh, the increase in white collar work that we're seeing. Let us jump to a break when we get back. We're visiting with John Ricker, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and we'll have more after this. I'm Major Matthew Newmeyer, currently stationed at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and I'm a Chickasaw. In 2003, when I was part of the drive to Baghdad, I found being a soldier was going to be a lot more than just firing your weapon and being in a combat situation. Being a warrior, but also being the good citizen. That is probably why American soldiers are so respected. Because here are 18 to 20 year olds, one minute they're in combat, people are shooting at them. The next minute they're treating children just as if they were in their own home. That warrior ethos that the Chickasaws had uh, also translates directly to what you do as a soldier. Strength, integrity, uh, the grace, and the idea that you're part of a greater community, that you give to that community, uh, that you find it important to be the best you can be at what you're doing. Home values are down in some states, but not in Oklahoma. Oklahoma's home values have increased 4.2% during the past 12 months. Unlike some states where home values have decreased as much as 20%. Good thing you're in Oklahoma. There may be real estate problems in some states, but there has never been a better time than now to buy or sell a home in Oklahoma. One of the most affordable states in the country, Oklahomans are buying and selling homes every day. And an Oklahoma Realtor can show you how. Good thing you're in Oklahoma. Okiwani is an Indian name for a place where children play. When we obtained the camp, we found a lot of oil debris left in the woods. We saw a commercial about how the oil and natural gas industry cleans up old oil well sites. We called the OERB and they agreed to remove tons of concrete and steel. It didn't cost us a thing. Thousands of children have left their footprints on this land. Thanks to the oil and gas industry, they will for a long time to come. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers, and we're interviewing John Richter, the U.S. Attorney's Office. When we left, you were discussing white collar and bankruptcy fraud. Well, uh, we, we're, very, we're certainly seeing um, when, when the economic tide goes out, it leaves a lot of uh, dirt and, and junk behind. And uh, 
we're certainly seeing that uh, across the country and, and, and we're certainly seeing that here in this district. We're very busy in, in the mortgage fraud uh, arena in particular, uh, bank fraud, uh, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of schemes that involve, uh, uh, obviously, you know, Robin Peter to pay Paul. Uh, a lot of pawn that we've certainly seen uh, our, our, our share of Ponzi schemes uh, that we're working on. Uh, and so this has meant that uh, uh, on the white collar side, my prosecutors and a lot of agents are, are very, mm -hmm. very busy right now. What's your percentage? Break it down. How much is white collar? How much is not white collar? Well, I have three teams in the office. Uh, I would say roughly about half of our work mm -hmm. is, is white collar in nature between what we would see our, as uh, accounting fraud, financial fraud, and other and fraud against the government, and other other types of um, larger fraud schemes. And then uh, another area that we work very hard in is the identity crimes area, identity theft and identity fraud, where people are taking. And we're certainly seeing plenty of that. Um, and that's the number one complaint that consumers have in Oklahoma, is relates to identity theft. Uh, and we are constantly uh, in close, close, closely working with the Oklahoma identity. Uh, theft Identity Crimes Task Force, we are constantly going after offenders who, who make use, fraudulent use of another person's identity to buy products and services and, you, and sell those products, usually for money to buy drugs. In this 2005 to 2009 time period uh, that, we're, that you've just experienced, is that uh, identity theft uh, on the increase or decrease or about holding its own? Well, uh, we have seen it go down steadily uh, in Oklahoma, according to the Federal Trade Commission, we've seen the complaints decrease in Oklahoma over this period. There's still a lot of them, and it's still the number one consumer complaint in Oklahoma. Um, but as compared to the other 50 states in the union, we seem to be moving down slightly. Um, here in western Oklahoma, this identity thefts and economic crime task force was set up in, in 2000, 2005, and it's been very, very busy. Um, and running down these schemes, we've recovered, um, uh, you know, we're somewhere in the teens in terms of the millions of dollars of losses um, that, ha that are attributable uh, to identity thieves. Now, as far as the task force is concerned, that would, uh, it would be a combination of your office and what other agencies? It's led by the Secret Service um, and then uh, local agencies uh, like the Oklahoma City Police Department, uh, Oklahoma County Sheriff's Office. Um, and, and, and FBI um, are, are very, very involved with it. Um, that is, you know, again, very much consumer fraud oriented. On the other side, then, we do, of course, a lot of the fin larger scale financial fraud. Most of that we do through our financial fraud task force, which is led by FBI, but also has uh, the IRS and the Secret Service. Uh, and we come at that, obviously, with, with, with everything we have. But, but when those cases don't plead out and they're ready to go to trial, it's one of your lawyers that, that stands up and puts the jury in the box. Absolutely. Uh, it'll be me or somebody else in my <laughs> office who gets it done. How proactive can your office be? In other words, are you reacting to the Ponzi schemes or reacting to the identity theft? Or are you proactively going out and trying to communicate to people the problems or, or trying to, to, uh, to set up a situation where you might be able to catch a crook before they've been able to act? Well, we do a lot of, there's a lot of public outreach on these issues on, of identity crimes as, and, and trying to warn, uh, warn the public and, and, and make members of the public um, listen and think carefully before they invest their money. Um, but um, the truism that a fool and his money is soon part, parted is, is uh, certainly uh, true as today as much as it, as, as it ever has been. And des despite other warnings, uh, very nice, very good people and, uh, end up uh, being defrauded. And oftentimes they're defrauded by very sophisticated actors um, who are putting up all kinds of uh, ingenious schemes to, to, to uh, depart, mm -hmm. to, to take the money. In poor economic times, does, does your office react? Do you see a certain number of crimes <laughs> no, taking place? Well, in terms of our reaction, obviously on, on the white collar side, we can usually only, uh, we, we do do some proactive things in the sense that we are constantly looking. Um, we have a, a suspicious activity report. Uh, team that works with our banking industry and looks at financial records that are that have to be filed with banks hmm. to look for the uh, at, at transfers of money to see whether there are particular indicia uh, that give rise uh, to suspicion uh, that may allow us uh, to go find it. Typically, uh, when we see that, of course, 
Um, that is essentially lead information that we then use to go gain further information and go after it. But obviously, once you're seeing a suspicious transaction, assuming for purposes of discussion that ultimately it is indicative of money that's being deposited that has been that is the result of fraud, the fraud has already taken place. Um, and all we're trying to do is catch it uh, in some way before someone comes forward. Uh, recently, we've seen uh, <clears throat> a very public uh, uh, announcement by the uh, new attorney general uh, uh, withdrawing, if you will, the uh, conviction of Senator Ted Stevens. Uh, I'm not interested in getting into that case in particular, but I am interested in you telling our viewers a little bit about uh, the obligation of a U.S. attorney's office to uh, turn over arguably exculpatory or uh, helpful evidence to the defense. Well, it's, it's black letter law that we have that requirement. Uh, that we have a requirement uh, to make sure that, that we satisfy uh, Rule 16 of the, of the, of the uh, criminal rules and that we turn over what's called Brady information, which is information that would uh, seemingly exculpate or, or uh, tend to show that a defendant did not commit the crime, as well as information, what we call impeachment information, information that might go uh, to call into question the credibility uh, of a witness whom the government uh, intends to call at trial. Uh, and so those are basic rights that every defendant has in going forward with a trial. Um, that information is supposed to be turned over on a timely basis and made advance, uh, in, in advance of trial, if at all possible. Obviously, if it comes up during the course of trial that the information is discovered, it needs to be turned over uh, quickly then. But that's a, a critical element of ensuring a fair trial. In a civil context, of course, both the plaintiff's side and the defense have basically those kinds of obligations if the right questions are asked turn over everything to the other side so because we're not in a trial by ambush type situation at least we hope we're not but I take it in the criminal side we don't have that mutuality you've got to turn over, turn over everything you've got but you don't get the same thing back from the defense well there is some mutuality um, it's it's not as broad as in the civil context um, obviously our requirements in terms of what we turn over are are slightly more limited than in the civil context, but the main thing is that we turn over what we intend to use at trial and anything that would call into question what we intend to use at trial. Um, the defense also, if they, obviously a, a defendant does, does not have to take the stand and testify, a right. defendant uh, does not have to present a defense. Ultimately, the burden lies on the United States to prove a, a, a defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and the defendant may sit, sit silent during an entire trial uh, if he chooses. Um, so the defendant has no obligation to turn anything over uh, if, in fact, he intends to provide nothing. On the other hand, uh, it, it is often the case that a, def a defendant may call a witness or witnesses or the defendant may t take the stand. And if there is information uh, mm -hmm. of, of a nature that, that is, uh, would fall within these same discovery obligations of the government, a defendant generally has the obligation mm -hmm. to turn the same kind of information over to us. Just some information on your position. Follow the, the supply chain from you up to the President of the United States. Whom do you report to? Whom does that person report to and on up? Um, as United States Attorney, I report to the Deputy Attorney General, um, which is the number two person in the department, who then reports to the Attorney General. Um, uh, and then obviously the Attorney General is answerable and on the Cabinet is answerable to the President. All right. John, thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you. Yeah, good Pleasure luck to, to you, here. John. Thank Best you. Best of luck. John Thanks. Richter is the U.S. Attorney General for the Western District in the state of Oklahoma. Kent, I'll be back with a final word right after this. It's time to meet the new people in power. The people responsible for our energy future. It's you. It's me. All of us together. From now on, we're, we're the, the people, people in power. og and &E will supply the power. It's how we apply the power that counts. We've got to use electricity smarter. Wiser. Cleaner. Better. So we've got to be informed. Equipped. Prepared. Committed. From now on. Look, nobody wants to waste energy. Nobody wants to build new power plants. Nobody wants to pay more for electricity. But nobody wants to give up their way of life. We don't have to. If we just use positive energy together. I'll take advantage of off-peak hours. That means cutting energy use from 1 to 7 every day. Every day. I'm going to sign up for more and more wind power. We'll take advantage of the high-tech tools coming soon from OG&E. OG and e can't do it alone. It's you and OG&E working together. Find dozens of ways you can help at OGE.com. A positive energy future is in our power, together. With all your power, what would you do? Dan Blankenship has stopped at the line of scrimmage. No gain on the play. Leading it fourth and seven on the Tiger, fourth and six yard line. 38 seconds on the clock, and the Tigers have no choice but to go. Ah. Wiggins had to do the kicking. Here's the snap.
good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First, loyal to Oklahoma, loyal to you. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. Welcome back to The Verdict. We're wrapping up a show with U.S. Attorney John Richter. Yes, uh, John is well known in the legal community as being a very effective and fair prosecutor. He's doing a wonderful job in his office, as are his assistants, of course. Uh, but they've got a tough job. They've got a mountain of work to do and, uh, and not near the resources they need to get it done. I'd like you to draw attention to our website, theverdict.tv. You can go to that website, tell us about a show that you'd like to see right here. We'll see you next week on another edition of the verdict. The preceding program was produced exclusively for the Cox Channel.